Hello and welcome to another episode of the Centralized Justice Broadcast. My name is Federico Ast, I am president at the Cooperative Cleros, and our guest today is Nathan Schneider, who is a scholar, activist and journalist, and since 2015 he has been a professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, so Schneider has been a leader and advocate of platform cooperativism. I actually um, first got in contact with him as I was at Singularity University and studying there and, and he came to give a, a talk to us about cooperatives and yeah and why they, they matter and I was at the moment where I was doing that kind of exploration that was 2016. Um, so And I also recommend uh, his book, uh, Everything for Everyone, The Radical Tradi Tradition That is Shaping the New Economy, that was published in 2018 by Nation Books. And I'm super happy to have you here, Nathan, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be in the presence of a really important uh, uh, blockchain-based cooperative. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I mean, let's start by the uh, same uh, way we start with all of our guests to, um, to know a bit about their background. I mean, how you got interested in working in journalism and what brought you to cooperatives. I mean, to know a bit more about your career. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I guess, uh, you know, one place to start is um, in January 2014, um, I was on a book tour for um, a book I'd written about Occupy Wall Street called Thank You Anarchy. And um, I'd been mainly a social movement journalist at that time covering protest movements, particularly in like 2011, 2012. And, um, and as I was touring around speaking about this book, um, I was just wondering, I was looking for where is the experimentation that I saw in those protest movements in 2011, 2012 and so forth, where is it going? Um, where, how can it continue? Um, I saw people in those occupied squares um, just deeply obsessively experimenting with the possibilities of democracy and self-governance. And, um, and so while I was on that tour, uh, I had coffee with a friend in San Francisco um, just before the event there. And he said, you know, there's this thing that just came out that you really got to see. And it was the Ethereum white paper. Um, and by that point, too, I was already starting to get deeply interested in the cooperative movement, this longer history. Um, but starting then, I was kind of looking at these two threads. On the one hand, this long tradition of cooperative business, businesses owned and governed by people um, who participate in them. Um, and then this, this kind of new explosion of possibilities in the, in the world of, of crypto and blockchain. Let me ask, I mean, what got you interested in the first place in cooperatives? I mean, you worked in a cooperative before or, is, I mean, where does this interest um, come from, you think? Yeah, I, I lived in a, a cooperative house um, uh, when I was in school. Uh, but I think really what got me into it at this point was I was seeing the importance of big tech platforms in mm -hmm. social movements that I was covering. Um, and I was also seeing the beginnings of anxiety among people about, are these things really accountable to us? How are they owned and governed? And it just seemed like a kind of powerful fit. I started seeing startups. Actually, um, for a really important site for me um, in this was the WeShare conference uh, that was happening in Paris uh, around that time. And th there, more than here in the US, I started seeing founders exploring like, okay, how could we actually share ownership and governance in an appropriate way? Um, how could we, you know, build a sharing economy that did sharing all the way down? And that just led me to, oh, okay, this is kind of like what people have been doing with cooperatives for a long time. And hmm. uh, so, so I just got, you know, just started to become clear, okay, we need to, you know, to, to, to make this online economy work for people the way they seem to want it to, we need to marry it to this cooperative tradition uh, one way or another. We need to figure out how to get this co-ownership involved. Can you, I mean, tell me a bit what you, you learned um, in the Occupy Wall Street movement? I mean, you did research on that and what, what were, were the learnings of how this worked? And I mean, at some point maybe stopped working because it, I mean, at some point it failed basically. Well, the, the, the biggest thing that 
I came away with and that I wanted to like tell the world about and writing a book on it was the 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 profound craving for deeper democracy that people were trying were, were practicing in those spaces, not just in Occupy, but in, in also the Arab Spring and the the movements across Europe in 2011. Um, you know, they were all exploring this these possibilities of decentralized movements, of leaderless movements, of of um, building direct democracy rather than representative democracy. Um, and 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 it was that powerful sense that we don't just want a policy change, you know, at the level of the existing government. We actually want to reimagine what democracy even means. And to me, that was a very powerful call. And I think a very necessary one. You know, democracy does not work in it, when it stays in place. It needs to continue evolving and and, and developing and this like craving among young people was was I think a deeply important signal um and and because you know for for various reasons you know the movements did not last um beyond a few months at a time um they were unable to kind of to continue those experiments and I think a lot of those cravings and and the excitement around those ideas actually ends up kind of collapsing like a bubble and and actually feeding into you know deep authoritarian tendencies saying okay well that that didn't work now let's just trust you know x or y leader um and um and and you know what one, one thing that i think is really important about things like uh, you know what what excited me about about learning about the ideas around ethereum was Okay, this could be a space where those experiments could continue without having to rely on an occupied square in the middle of a of a city. Mm. Um, that these these were places where um, people could craft and cultivate, you know, different kinds of possibilities for self governance uh, without, you know, in a way that could be more enduring. Um, and and the existing online platforms again were not good spaces for doing that self governance. They were good spaces for spreading messages, but not for self governing. Um, blockchains have some have some affordances, have some capacities that actually incline people toward that self governance if you know if they if they so choose. And um, and so in that way, it was kind of a unique opportunity to 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 port those experiments into digital life. At the same time, these technologies are capable of all sorts of other stuff, but um, but that possibility at least is there. So many of our listeners are like um, not, not experts in, I mean, decentralized governance. So can you explain very briefly what is a platform cooperative and what is the connection with, with blockchain? Yeah. So a platform cooperative is uh, a, it's really just like a, cooperative business that is mainly run online. So examples are like um, uh, uh, Stocks United, a uh, stock photo platform based in Canada, owned by stock photographers all around the world and, and video makers and other kinds of creators. Um, so the artists themselves own and govern the platform they use to sell their work. Or Up and Go, which is a worker uh, platform co-op in New York primarily that, that um, uh, is owned and governed by people who do housework, house cleaning. Um, and so the idea is put the people who are, you know, directly involved in the platform in charge. And, you know, that's a, it's an exciting way of rethinking the, the gig economy and so forth. You know, the problem is that you end up losing a lot of the superpowers that the platform economy has for growth and development, like venture capital isn't really compatible with this stuff. Um, another thing is that it's really hard for people to, I think, build cooperative practice in just like everyday online spaces. And this is a pattern that I call implicit feudalism, is that in every um, social space, whether it's a subreddit or a Facebook group or a Discord or, or you know, a Twitch channel, pick your poison, um, you know, the way our systems are designed is for somebody generally a founder to have like total control over who gets to be in the system and who gets mm. to be in the space. And there really aren't um, capacities for, for instance, joint decision-making or conflict resolution. So the kinds of things that Kleros, you know, is involved in, in making possible are not available in Facebook groups in, in, in the long history of, of online spaces. And 
you know, in, in important ways, blockchains, I think, open up the possibility because they are not kind of, you know, centrally owned by default. They're more like, you know, collectively owned by default, potentially. Um, they open the door for us to discard that assumption of implicit feudalism and how we design online spaces and instead to to adopt uh, some of these more cooperative practices, assume that we are going to have conflicts that we have to resolve, assume that we're going to have to have some ways to to uh, uh, count votes and make decisions. And so infrastructure like Claros or like decision making tools like Boardroom or, or Snapshot, you know, it's not an accident that those kinds of things were, have not become available in like the last 20 years of, you know, of the development of online spaces. But now suddenly they seem necessary. You know, I'm from Argentina originally, and the first like, contact we had with, um, I had with like cooperatives was uh, in 2001, there was a very big economic crisis and many companies like failed. And the workers that they were going to become unemployed, they tried to get, I mean, to, to start controlling the companies and start working. And they did a, I would say, informal cooperative. Um, yeah. But, you know, none of those survived in the end because of, um, I, I guess, poor management, maybe incentives were not great at the long term. So I think lots of the challenges that we will have in the online I mean, world of uh, cooperatives, we already had in the offline world of cooperatives, right? I mean, can you explain a bit what, I mean, what are the main challenges that exist in, in running a cooperative uh, business and uh, or company in general? Um, so what, what, what are the difficulties of this? Well, first, I just want to stress that, you know, the importance of that, of that example. So for instance, that um, at least in, in my experience, um, those recuperated factories, um, uh, were, you know, were, were of great interest to people in the, in the U.S. Here, for for instance, um, uh, one of the really major intellectual architects of Occupy Wall Street, uh, Marina Citrin, um, just before Occupy began, wrote a book called um, Horizontalism that was based on her studies of of those factories and and movements in Argentina, and um, and and that in turn informed, you know, the practice in the in the social movements. Um, in in 2011, and then and then also um, in the U.S., we've had a um, uh, in a lot of our our new worker co-op financing architecture has been done kind of in partnership with and learning from uh, the the Argentine examples. But it's in in many ways it's a reminder to me of how poorly equipped the existing economy is to support cooperatives. I think a lot of you know. There are, in any kind of business, some work out well, some don't. Um, but what you see with 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 a lot of cooperatives recently is that you you have systemic issues that that derive from the fact that the economy is not designed to support them. Uh, I mean, in those in those cases, those were desperate attempts to save people's jobs in the context of a total economic collapse. You know, the the, the circumstances arrayed against them were immense. But then also you have an economy that is designed primarily for investors. This is something I experience all the time working with, with new cooperatives. You know, I, I co-founded an accelerator for co-ops called Start.coop. These, th these co-ops are systematically under um, disadvantaged up against venture-backed um, alternatives. And it doesn't have to be this way. I mean, in just U.S. history, for instance, really, really significant um, co-op development, very, very, some of the most powerful acts of economic development in our history, particularly rural electrification, the development of the of the um, agricultural cooperative system, um, were made possible at times when the government stepped in and created comparable financing infrastructure to what other kinds of businesses can access. Um, and suddenly cooperatives showed up everywhere in those industries. Um, and and so it's a it's a really important reminder that in order to enable shared ownership to happen, you need infrastructure for it. Just like to have investor ownership, you need stock markets, you need securities registration, you need um, enforcement mechanisms, you need courts, you need all the, these things that make a financial mm -hmm. system work. And so when we don't produce those for shared ownership models, 
and then we get surprised that <laughs> these things don't yeah. set up and thrive. You know, it's crazy. And 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 that's a, a really important, you know, cautionary tale for developing the, you know, the crypto world is that if we want, you know, blockchains to enable more shared ownership, we have to design infrastructure to support it. We won't, we can't just assume it's going to arise on its own while investors are pouring millions and millions of dollars through VC funds into, into crypto projects and DAOs. Let me ask, I mean, so, okay, we know what are the difficulties of uh, on challenges of building a cooperative, you know, lack of market tools, you know, lack of funding coming from VCs. On the other side, what are the advantages of um, making a project that works as a cooperative? I, I think the fundamental advantage is alignment, right? Is, um, is that you have a long-term alignment between the participants in the economy and Uh, the benefits of the economy. I mean, right now we have this problem that, you know, Cory Doctorow has beautifully called enchidification, where, mm -hmm. you know, wonderful, convenient tech startups show up and like change our lives with their wonderful platforms. And then like 10 years later, um, you know, they end up, you know, they end up turning on us, right? <laughs> Because we re realize, oh, okay, you know, you actually don't care about us as workers. You actually don't care about us as consumers. Um, you're just trying to extract as much as you possibly can on behalf of your investors. You know, the goal here is to create businesses that are able to have long-term healthy relationships with the people who use them. Um, and, you know, sometimes that means in a cooperative, like lots and lots of democracy and participation from lots of users. Um, but, you know, often at large scales, you end up with companies that are very similar to other kinds of companies most of the time. Right. The credit union I use for, you know, my home loan, right, on a daily basis looks a lot like the corporate bank down the street. It's just that, you know, sometimes the corporate bank starts defrauding people like crazy and the credit union doesn't. It just doesn't have that incentive. <laughs> so in some ways, you can think about a cooperative less as like a utopia than just like a protection against really bad stuff. Um, and and and, you know, further, it can do more. It can create capacities for you know, some forms of governance participation, it can create capacities to distribute, you know, excess back to the members rather than to some corporate overlord. Um, it just enables also local control in a way that, um, in, that in a way that might not be possible uh, for investor backed companies. For instance, you know, I, in my town, there are two hardware stores two blocks away from each other. One is Home Depot. It's a giant chain. It's like every other Home Depot. The people who work there, you know, are really hard to find. And, you know, half the time they don't know, you know, what, you know, they don't know anything about what you're looking for. On the other hand, there's a, um, uh, a locally owned store that is part of a national cooperative for purchasing called Ace Hardware. This local store is like totally of the community. You know, there are people there who've been working there for 25, 30 years. They're everywhere. They're really friendly. You know, it, it's just a store that has been able to invest in the community because it's cooperative is mm -hmm. accountable to it. Its job is not to siphon money to the to the national business. The national business's job is to support the local business. And that's a it's a it's an inversion of how the uh, of what business is all about. That's super interesting. You know, also in my experience of, you know, working at Cleros, I think that one of the main advantages I maybe found um, the cooperative model is it tends to attract people with, I'd say, better incentive, better values, maybe, I'd say, I mean, not <laughs> people, especially when you are working in the blockchain, you know, when we don't tend to have like a, lots of profile applying for jobs where they just want to be rich, you know, next week. I mean, they kind yeah. of, I think they are more like a long-term oriented. And, um, and in the end, you know, this kind of produces, a, I would call a goodwill of the company um, that uh, creates a value. I know you have some thoughts about, about this. Well, so how, how, how far do those vibes go? I mean, I, one thing I worry about sometimes is too much reliance on the co-op <laughs> vibes. You know, sometimes when I get founders come in who are just excited about creating a co-op, but they don't have, you know, the business sorted out, you know, they're not actually creating something that's going to delight people. Um, you've got a problem. I mean, I know, I know where, where you're going and, 
I, there is also one specific element maybe of Claro that people tend to have more like a free market ideology. I mean, Claros is lots about markets. It's lots about uh, economic incentives. So we kind of have people who are interested in this cooperative model, but not, you know, like, um, I don't want to say left wing, but I mean, you, you know what I mean, I guess, you know, uh, they, they, they are like people that believe in markets. They, they, they believe, you know, in the, so it's kind of, we have a bit of both worlds, right? Um, and I also think that, uh, what we do, I mean, being very much, you know, innovation oriented in the sense of lots of re research and development, uh, also kind of attracts people of a certain, you know, we don't tend to attract, you know, the degen kind of, you know, crypto worker. So I don't know. I don't have much, you know, um, data to compare with other projects, you know, but I, that's my, I mean, impression of, of how we, we do recruitment and the kind of profiles we get. Well, that, that kind of balance is, is so important because the cooperatives are two things. You know, it's a it's a kind of it's a movement, first of all. I mean, there is an international cooperative alliance with values and principles, right? Things like cooperation among cooperatives and education of members and, you know, these kinds of values, solidarity. Um, but it's also a kind of business and you need people who are focused on on that side, on, on, on the practical outcomes and, and sometimes too much on the value side, you end up creating a utopia and then yeah. one thing goes wrong and, and everybody scatters. Um, and I, you know, one, you know, compliment I, <laughs> I heard of, you know, my book that was not meant this way was, you know, somebody who was thinking of starting a cooperative Reddit and said, Oh, you know, you focus so much on the flaws, um, of, of cooperatives, like, now I'm not so sure I want to start one. And I thought, great. You know, my goal was to, was to, was to, you know, pit, uh, uh, put a pin in the balloon of, you know, the utopianism and, and make sure that people are not doing this because they think it will solve all the problems in the world, but because it's a framework for actually building something cool. And it's a framework for doing it in a, in a values and value aligned way. Um, and 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 so having that balance in your organization is so important to have the people who are in some ways, you know, more idealistic and willing to hold those values, but also people who recognize that, look, if we don't deliver something awesome to our members or to our customers or to whoever, you know, we need to, you know, we need to do something great for, um, you know, what's the point of all the rest of it? Um, hmm. you know, none of the rest of it matters. So so it's 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 incredibly important to have both of those um, in any cooperative. So this is very interesting. So uh, let's move into the you know realm of you know governance. So people sometimes think that working at a cooperative is like, hey, let's just meet and let's let me make vote about what we're going to do. I mean, it doesn't work like that. In the end, I'm me as as president. I am I, I mean accountable to the partners, but mm -hmm. in the everyday work of the cooperative and the company. I mean, there is hierarchy, there is, I mean, there, there is uh, some verticality and it's not that any, I mean, anyone can, and, and we do, I mean, have a lot of encouraging of voice and people saying what they don't like, uh, but in the end, at some point, a decision is, is made and, and, and you need to be aligned with the decision that, that we made. And then next, in the next meeting, yearly meeting, annual meeting, you can, if you don't agree, then we can discuss, right? But that should not, um, you know, uh, be an obstacle to execution. Um, so tell me a bit about how the governance, you know, work in, in your experience with the cooperatives and, and what are the main challenges there? I, I think it's it, it's more similar to other kinds of businesses than people often want to think. Right. And 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 that's OK. I mean, a lot of the lessons about how to manage large organizations are you know, kind of where we are culturally, they're, they're the best we've figured out in all kinds of contexts. And a lot of like investor backed, highly centralized tech startups have highly participatory cultures, right? And, and have a lot of things going in them around transparency of information and self-criticism that I wish more cooperatives had. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's important to stress that, that the, the most important difference, um, 
for a cooperative is who are you ultimately accountable to? And like the way I think about it is like, who is someone like you lying awake at night worrying about? If you're the kind of person who lies awake at night, I, I am. Um, you know, and and it's usually a pretty good indicator of who I'm accountable to is who I'm worried about when I have a hard decision to make and I have to make some trade-offs. And I know that, you know, there, there are going to be downsides on, you know, no matter what. Um, an investor back company is going to have to make the decision on the side of investors, probably. Um, that is their chief obligation. And, and they might have other considerations and they want to make their workers happy. They want to make their, you know, their, their users happy. But when they have to make a sacrifice, it's probably not going to be the investors who get sacrificed um, because those investors can fire that, that person. Um, in the context of a cooperative, the hope is that at least, even if it looks in every other way, like every other company in the industry, the hope is that at least that ultimate accountability is somewhere else. Um, now, that said, there are, um, you know, what we see in, in research data on, for instance, employee ownership. Um, uh, we, you know, we have a structure in the U.S. for employee ownership that actually does allow for some some financing, kind of similar to the Argentine case around recuperated factories. But in this case, we have the ability to do large scale um, leverage buyouts by workers, and so we have, you know, companies with, uh, you know, large number of companies that use this structure called an ESOP, and it actually doesn't require any worker governance involved involvement, except for things like um, an acquisition and things like that. But what we find from the data is actually, if we pair that shared ownership with some forms of employee participation in, in management, things like open book accounting, where you're sharing data about the company with everybody in it, um, so that they can see more clearly how they fit in a bigger picture, um, and more more kind of open, transparent discussion about, about business decisions that actually that pairing of ownership and shared management um, produces really consistent productivity gains. Um, so, so I think it's all, it, it, it's, it's a benefit if you can pair appropriate self-government, you know, forms of, of participatory governance with that co-ownership, you know, it becomes a superpower, it makes that ownership uh, even more powerful makes makes people more want you know want to be more invested in 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 where they work, um, but it is really important to set expectations right. If you set the expectation that oh you're a co owner that means you get to you know decide everything, um, you know you're going to end up with really frustrated really disillusioned people. You 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 want to create that expectation of recognizing okay you have you have some voice but there are a lot of other people who who have voice too and so there's a process. Um, and so that expectation setting is is so important, you know, in the same way that we need to learn those expectations for ourselves as citizens in a in a democratic society, recognize that just because I'm a citizen doesn't mean I get, you know, I get to make all the decisions unilaterally, right? It's it's a process. In my experience, you know, you do get some people coming with some, I would say, childish, you know, expectations of how the world, you know, works. Um You, you wrote a very influential paper that, by the way, is mandatory reading for everyone who joins Kleros. It's about crypto economics as a limitation on governance. Can you explain a bit what was the thesis in that article? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so, so that for me really came out of, um, of, of, you know, really being a kind of fan of, you know, Vitalik Buterin's writings, going back to that encountering the the white paper in 2014 and um being just fascinated by the um the quest to use economic incentives to structure you know organizational life on blockchains um but then also recognizing that hey there is a long tradition of concern and critique about relying just on economics to run the world and Um, and so my goal was to bring that cooperative tradition, which is very much that it's, it's very much a, a tradition of saying, okay, let's bring our full selves, not just our economic interests into a business. Let's build democracy into a business. And then also, you know, critiques of, of the kind of neoliberal turn in politics, this idea that, oh, we don't need, you know, politics anymore. We can just 
do everything with markets. And that kind of thinking has run aground so many times, whether it's, you know, privatizing water markets or, um, you know, I, I, over and over when we've seen excess privatization and reliance on markets, we've seen profound harm to, to human beings and the ecosystem. Um, and so it, the article was just a plea to say, OK, you're doing really cool stuff with with economics here, but we're going to have to take, you know, human beings and 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 you know, for lack of a better word, politics seriously too, and um, and I proposed some strategies for how to do that and how to actually combine the cool things happening with with economic mechanism design with with stuff that's a little more political. And and you know, one thing that's been really gratifying to me to see since then is um, is how much discussion has arisen in this direction. So, for instance, Vitalik got into you know, this idea of soul bound tokens, you know, like it or hate that particular technical proposal. I think there's widespread recognition that we do need strategies that for governance in, in crypto that recognize human beings as participants, not just tokens as participants. Um, and, and, you know, every time I talk to people running DAOs, you know, they're trying to figure out some version of this to balance economic, the economic dynamics with the human dynamics. And, that challenge, I think, is 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 well underway, and I think we're seeing a new generation of governance design starting to emerge that that recognize more of this. And and you know, I think I think we need to go further and and really make sure that we are designing, you know, these emerging structures more around people than around tokens. Um, but you know, I I think I think the the ecosystem is heading and. In a better direction um, than it was when I then I wrote that piece. I also think that there are some uh, like technical improvements that have been happening in recent years. So when we started Claros, the only way you could incentivize people was through economic means because you didn't have a identity system, so you uh, couldn't have a way to. I mean, punish, you know, or reward um, individual users just because they would create a new account and you don't have a problem, a solution with the, to the civil attacks, right? So there is this project we have been working on for some time now, uh, Proof of Humanity, that actually is going to make, this is just one, there are other initiatives for, for identity uh, that is actually going to make this possible. And now if you have a stable online on-chain identity, and then you combine this with, you know, the SBT's ideas, um, then you can start producing uh, systems of incentives that are, if you want, more sophisticated and more political or that address a number of, you know, uh, concerns of motive or motivations of people that go beyond, you know, the purely economic incentives that crypto economics is based on, right? So I think that there is a bit of a development that was necessary on anti-civil you know, mechanisms. And uh, let me um, take you a bit uh, to, um, so you have been working for a while now in cooperatives and you learned a lot of what works, what doesn't work. Let's say I'm someone who is just starting a, you know, a new business. I mean, why, would I, why should I consider doing this uh, as a cooperative instead of normal company? What would you say? Um, well, for, first of all, I would question the normal. Um, you know, the cooperative tradition, for instance, goes back in you know in in Europe and North America to about the same starting point as the you know the the publicly traded company. Um, so so this is it's a parallel tradition, um, and uh, and and it's a tradition that has gotten less support since then. It has accumulated less wealth, um, but it doesn't have to. Um, and the, the the critical argument I would I would start with is what I see among founders all the time in particularly private conversations with founders of successful tech startups is I you know I hear them saying I lost the thing I built you know I lost I lost control of it myself but more importantly um, I lost the ability to center it on the mission. That I built it with. I mean, we saw this, for instance, when, um, you know, around the time of the sale of Twitter to Elon Musk, um, you know, Jack Dorsey was saying publicly and privately, this never should have been a company. You know, this whole thing is structured 
backward because we could never really fulfill our mission and do it right because of the incentives that investors placed on us. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's it's about it's about developing an incentive design, a value alignment for the long term. And and um, and right now, you know, that involves some costs up front because we don't have as active a investment ecosystem for cooperatives. But you know, that's not entirely true in crypto, right? In crypto, we have the ability to um to 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 fund things in ways that we might not be able to um outside of it. And so we might be able to overcome some of those things. But the 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 the, the critical goal here and the critical possibility is of building um organizations, technologies that are deeply aligned to the people that they're designed, they're meant to serve. Um, and if you you go the route of a venture capital and ultimately investor control, you're really, really risking that, you know, and, and you're risking it in ways that can be hard to anticipate at the beginning, um, but that but that will play out later on down the line once those investors need the liquidity that they need to return to their investors. Um, and so so it's it's a it's a long game. And it's about ensuring that the thing you build and that you love um, is going to be, you know, aligned right for the long term. You know, at, at Claros, we didn't um, have VC funding for, for the project. Uh, so we don't have this type of pressures from a VC that needs to return money. Of course, we do have token holders which entrusted the project and they bought at the public sale, but not, you know, uh, a VC who got a special treatment just because they, they had more money. So, and this is something that yeah. we decided like uh, five years ago when we started. And I think that the advantage of that is actually starting to become more evident as time goes by and the project matures. At the moment, at the beginning, it was not very evident why we were doing that because we could have raised more money instead of, but, but, but we did it in this way. And I think it's, Payoff is you know, kind of being more clear now than the past. And I think uh, maybe it has to do with making a community that is with the right type of value, especially for a project that is kind of trying to sell you know, fairness and transparency, right? So this is also important as part of a proposition for, for a proposition. Let me, I mean, ask you just well, one more just question. One thing yeah. I wanna, yeah. I just want to add to that, that is, is that here, you know, another reason that we're seeing people, for instance, DAOs incorporate as cooperatives is that cooperatives legally are a structure that that facilitates community fundraising. Um, and so the kinds yeah. of things that people have been doing for with DAOs, like getting a bunch of users to buy tokens and using that to fund a project is actually what cooperatives have been doing for a long time. And um, if you're concerned about legal reg- registration and so forth, you know, cooperatives may be a really excellent pathway for for addressing those concerns. And so, um, here in Colorado, in particular, where we have, um, you know, the best co-op laws in the country, um, we've got a lot of um, DAOs incorporating as cooperatives. So, for instance, you know, listeners, some listeners may be coming to ETH Denver um, in early March, uh, which is one of the big Ethereum conferences um, that that we host here in in Denver every year, and that's organized as a Colorado cooperative for these reasons. Hmm. Um, as well as, um, you know, a number of other projects. So it's a, um, you know, increasingly a tool that like help also helps, you know, crypto projects do the things they want to do um, legally. That's So we are incorporated in, in France as a social cooperative that is a part of French legislation in the 1940s when they used this for agricultural, you know, um, cooperatives. And this kind of was a good fit for, for crypto, right? So that's why we chose this type of, of structure. Um, well, that's, it's, it's good to know that Colorado has the same type of, of law. Yeah, also started by our <laughs> farmers, you know. Of course, you know. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, back to the basics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, two more questions. So, uh, first, you already mentioned, I mean, let's say I'm the guy who wants to start a cooperative. Okay, I decided I want to use a cooperative structure, a cooperative, you know, type of business. What are the first steps? I mean, you have this accelerator. What do you tell people who you are incubating? I mean, how to proceed with the first steps in, in this cooperative, you know, endeavor? Um. I, I think it really it varies a lot. 
Um, and and I would like to see more pathways. I mean, right now the the most common first step is um, okay, find a lawyer and start drafting bylaws and figure it out. Figure it out. I I fear that that's too much complexity, too much upfront. Um, and that's one reason that I proposed this idea of exit to community, right? As a, a, a storyline, not for everybody, but for businesses that haven't really figured out their stakeholder model at the very beginning, right? And maybe take on some early investment at the beginning, but want to move toward, you know, something like cooperative ownership. Um, and and that that's taken on you know a lot of interest in the in the crypto community because sometimes you don't know you know, how much you want to distribute governance of a project that still hasn't really figured itself out yet. Mm. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of, you know, I think it's totally okay to try to develop a strategy where, you know, you retain a lot of control early on and then gradually disseminate it as, you know, as your community matures. And and we've been doing that with Colorado co-ops using like founder, special founder shares so that founders have, you know, have their own, um, you know, ha have real control at the beginning, but gradually or or maybe suddenly that that starts to disappear um, or it starts to 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 be reduced. Um, you know, my my dream is to enable, you know, one click co-ops to make cooperatives a kind of default way of organizing um, in online space. And one experiment with that that um, I've been running for the last five years with lots of other people is called social.coop. It's a Mastodon instance, you know, this like open source Twitter alternative. Um, and rather than incorporate it as a separate cooperative, we ended up just running it on open collective, which is a tool. It's kind of like Patreon for groups and it's a wonderful organization and platform, very co-op friendly. And they, um, ena it enables us to, um, be fiscally sponsored. We never incorporated as a cooperative. We, for many years, we ran without enough money to even do that. Um, but you know, my hope is that you know, through things like DAOs and and Open Collective, it becomes easier and easier for just groups of people who want to do something online to form a democratic structure for doing it and to pool money and resources mm -hmm. and make decisions about those things together. Um, and right now, I still think that's harder than it should be. Um, and we have to recognize that. We have to recognize that we're not seeing more like natural cooperative formation because our tools don't really support it well. Um, but but I think, you know, again, tools like Claros and other, other kinds of governance um, uh, technologies are getting us closer to being able to uh, incorporate, you know, uh, 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 cooperative practices into our everyday lives. And maybe a lot of it isn't going to be formally incorporated legally as cooperatives. And I think that's, that's okay. You know, ultimately what matters to me most is, you know, that, that there's economic justice, that people who are creating value are, are able to receive value, um, are able to receive the value they create and are able to have a say in, uh, the places that they work and, and rely on. So um, whatever legal form that needs to take, you know, let's make it work somehow. And, um, and, and you know, that requires building up a tool, you know, a, a, an ecosystem of tooling. Um, it requires building the means for decision making, for, for, for management, for conflict resolution. And those things are, you know, it's the same old executive, legislative, judicial, you know, <laughs> br uh, branches that you see in other kinds of democracies. Um, but um, having those in place is is critical. And if you don't have them, you know, people are going to default to something much more autocratic. Finally, um, what resources, book, movies or whatever can you recommend to people who want to start I mean, learning about platform cooperatives, DAOs and, and governance and all, all, all this? Um, that's a great, great question. Um, so yeah, in addition to to my book, everything for everyone, um, I've got a new one that hopefully will come out later this year or maybe early next year um, called Governable Spaces. That's on online governance and uh, uh, the the quest for more of it. Um, at the same time, I would recommend looking at um, the Platform Cooperative Consortium. They're running a, a co-op school. 
uh, right now, and uh, they've been doing really great work um, uh, uh, gathering people from all over the world who are interested in building digital cooperatives um, and helping them tool up and meet each other and and, and learn from each other. Um, if you're in North America, check out start.coop, this um, accelerator uh, for uh, for co-ops. Um, and, um, and, and one book that I really appreciate, you know, there, there's, there's so much. Um, uh, one that, that I think is a really great starting point is um, called Owning Our Future by Marjorie Kelly. Um, it's not about just co-ops, it, but it introduces this idea of generative rather than extractive ownership. How do you d- design ownership in a way that it supports communities rather than takes from them? Um, and it explores a lot of different ways for doing that. None of it involves crypto, but I think it's really important for, you know, people in crypto to recognize that, you know, the conversations, and the things they're struggling with are go go way back. Um, and uh, and also, if somebody's interested in learning more about the, the factories in Argentina, uh, there's a, a film in English called The Take um, uh, by uh, Abby Lewis and... and um, uh, Naomi Klein, that that I really recommend to uh, learn more about that story that we were talking about earlier. Ethan Schneider, thank you very much for joining us at this episode of the Centralized Justice Broadcast. Uh, I'm Federico Ast, I am the president of the Cooperative Cleros, and I was super happy to have this discussion about cooperatives, you know, the future of, of governance, and see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. <laughs>